So I guess let's start with you for a second, James. Uh, you have managed to achieve spectacular results in providing financial services for African businesses, entrepreneurs, um, and, and local people. You've grown uh, and provided opportunities for them. What are the challenges that finance and the development of the financial sector can help solve in terms of sustainable growth and development? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the financial sector can really contribute significantly to the achievement of sustainable goals. One, by allocating resources so that aspirations and dreams towards sustainability can be funded and realized. That's, that's really the critical. The second one is um, what one would call directive financing. You could avoid uh, financing projects that are a threat to sustainability of the world. And th that way, uh, the financial sector could really be a, a watchdog for, for society uh, through the allocation mechanism. And lastly, it can do on capacity building. The financial sector, together with partners, whether it is um, the civil society, the NGOs, the development institutions, could couple financing with the capacity building. Uh, such that really the new th uh, thinking process could quickly be uh, transmitted to the actors in the field. So mobile finance has been a major uh, development in the field. Uh, do you think that uh, the opportunities in mobile finance, uh, the application of digital technology to this sector and people providing people with cell phones and applications that tie them into the economy, does this allow some of the emerging market populations and underserved communities greater access to be able to sort of leapfrog into development in ways that they, they weren't able to in the past? Uh, digitization certainly will transform the way we do things. The Internet of Everything, for instance, uh, the, with the digitalization of the whole ecosystem would then uh, make it uh, uh, very easy. But uh, the low-income population would be best leashed through the mobile phone because these are devices that already exist. So the question is, how do we create interoperable systems uh, that uh, can be uh, uh, accessed through the mobile phone? But we didn't need... Um, to distinguish between the mobile phone being a product and the mobile phone being a channel. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the mobile phone is a channel. The world seems to have really drifted uh, to, to the misconception that the fact that people have mobile connectivity and mobile banking transfer, that is financial inclusion. Financial inclusion includes products. It's about products not having a channel. So it's a question of how do we create the regulatory framework that allows collaboration between the financial service providers and the infrastructure owners, uh, such that you can optimize uh, that capability that exists. You now, that's a good entree into <coughs> Sashi Shanoi, so your work. Uh, how, what are the special challenges that the ultra-poor uh, face in terms of being connected to the broader economy uh, being drawn into it so they can both receive its benefits but also participate and lift themselves up from the desperate poverty they've been. Well, how, how, what are learnings have you found in terms of in working with uh, entrepreneurs in, in you know, underserved communities? Mm -hmm. So um, in my decade or so of working with the ultra-poor in India, I have seen obviously a very strong correlation between extreme poverty and chronic unemployment, right? And one of the only ways to really tackle that is to go into these communities and empower the small businesses that are already there, fund them, give them the support and mentorship they need, grow them so that they can create the jobs for the people that are in those communities that are seeking employment and seeking stable income. Now, um, you, you, you might think, well, this sounds like microfinance. Isn't this what the microfinance movement has done? And while that movement has been very commendable, it has given rise to very small businesses, but those businesses then can't grow to the next level because microfinance loans peter out right around, say, $800 or $1,000. If you're an entrepreneur that needs like $5,000 or 10 or 20 to take your business to the next level and employ 200 people or 500 people, where do you get the funding to do that? If you're somewhere in a tier two, tier three city in India or, you know, in rural India, there is no funding available. And that's really where we come in. Uh, we, our smallest investment starts at 5,000. It can grow all the way up to 100,000. 
we keep funding as the entrepreneur meets his or her milestones. And um, our, you know, the agreement we have with them is that you must employ the poorest of the poor in your communities for us to keep funding you. So let me, let me follow up with a question for the, the same one that I asked James, which is wouldn't uh, digitization and the connection to a larger economic network get uh, help some of those entrepreneurs and, and uh, individuals get past the restrictions of geography? Does it matter whether you're in a, a tier two or a tier three city in remote uh, rural India? Because you'd be able uh, through, through digital networks to connect to broader institutions wherever they might be located. Mm -hmm. Is that a way of getting past that? Absolutely, and we are seeing that uh, take hold more and more in India, and so I am very optimistic. We certainly haven't made the strides that they have in Kenya, but I think it's getting there. But then you're pointing to what else exists outside of funding that's the big challenge, right? And what we're seeing is even when funding is available, a lot of these entrepreneurs do need the mentorship. We talked a little bit about technical assistance before, you know, Neil Ghosh brought that up, and I cannot underline that enough. Um, our entrepreneurs, I mean, we've seen across our portfolio, they struggle the most with financial literacy. They, you know, when they're operating a business at a small scale, they've kept crude records of their profit and loss statements, and, and they can do things at a certain scale, but then when they take the business to the next level, and suddenly they have 200 employees and they need to keep a balance sheet, they need to keep track of their inventory, they're managing cash flows in a very difficult environment, they need help with those things. And so um, it's very important that along with funding, we're providing them the close mentorship and really tailoring financial management solutions for their sector and their industry. And that's something that doesn't scale as easily. Nalini, we heard in the previous session that uh, factors such as environmental sustainability and inclusive growth are being added into contemporary definitions of growth and development. Uh, so you work on health and non-communicable diseases. Uh, these are areas which have traditionally been seen in some respects as separate from straightforward growth and development and so forth. But it, it, is it actually uh, something that's directly connected uh, to the kinds of questions that, uh, that, that James and uh, 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 Ms. Shinoi have been talking about? Yeah. No, I'm so glad um, that we are talking about health in the context of sustainable growth and equity. Um, it's really important with all this uh, sustainable development goals discussion this week uh, that we uh, all realize that you cannot have a sustainable future without health. You have to address health in order to take care of the future. And in terms of health, um, the space that I work in is non-communicable diseases. These are chronic diseases. Um, four of them um, are included in the WHO definition, and that's cancer, uh, heart disease, diabetes, and chronic lung diseases. These together cause two out of three deaths in the world, and um, they are the 80% of those deaths are in lower and middle income countries. Um, so if you take India, for instance, 20% of India has um, at least one chronic disease, 10% has more than one. It affects younger people. Indians get diabetes about 10 years earlier than their um, other um, than people in the West. And if you think about it, half of India is under the age of 25. Two-thirds of India is under the age of 35. And if Indians are getting diabetes in their 30s and 40s, um, you know, the public health challenge in a country that's already reeling with maternal mortality and child, uh, you know, under five child mortality and TB and malaria and HIV now has this huge looming problem of chronic diseases and non-communicable diseases in front of it. So that's why uh, we chose to work um, in that space. Um, Arogya means in Sanskrit good health, and we work um, in India to uh, do chronic disease prevention. So, James, go back. Let me go back to you for a second. Uh, the American financial sector has, uh, in recent years, gotten a reputation as a place where it has, has outsized rewards for people doing very risky and not particularly socially useful uh, things. Uh, in Africa, however, uh, and in much of the developing world. The actual, the extension and development of finance is an incredibly important part of development. So do bankers in, in Africa have a different reputation than bankers in New York? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, it's true that uh, in the developing world, the our financial system is still conservative. And it has really focused on uh, the basic intermediation. And so uh, 
at that level, or the grassroots level, it has a positive view. However, uh, the banking system is uh, interconnected uh, globally. So essentially, that reputation has creeped, and banks, we, we are not being treated very well nowadays. <laughs> But presumably, some of the kinds of things that we would want to see in the financial sector and that would help you and your business are the kind of things we'd want to see more generally for the economy. Transparency, stable regulatory structures, the opportunity to, to grow and, and, and engage more people in the economy. And, and governance in Africa, in, let, let's be honest, presents often challenges in those areas. So uh, how, how, can, how can those obstacles be overcome? Uh, thank you. It, it's really a, a huge challenge. Uh, and that is where the private sector can play a significant role. We must uh, be the change that we want to see in our societies. And as the private sector leads that, essentially you see that um, spreading through society. But essentially we could also have institutional transformations, particularly from a regulatory perspective. That again we can achieve a lot from a policy uh, development perspective. And uh, lastly is um, the integration and in engagement and involvement of the society. The society must be the watch, watchdog of what happens within the, uh, the community. So if we c get that voice becoming louder and louder, uh, we'll see more and more changes. Sachi, let me, let me go back to you now, Sachi. Uh, so, so in the past, uh, a lot of uh, young people interested in driving change in and helping the poorest of the poor would have been involved in some kind of direct aid provision. They would have seen it as kind of charity or philanthropy. You're helping to spur entrepreneurship. Uh, is that representative of a kind of different attitude that uh, that 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 people have today about what really is the best solution to uh, the problems of global poverty? You know, it, I think it is a shifting perception in India, at least where I work. Um, for the longest time, entrepreneurship was not even seen in the same lens as it is here in the US. Here, I think we do glamorize it. You know, we talk so much about the intrepid entrepreneurs and what they're doing. And in India, um, entrepreneurship was something you did when you didn't get a real job. <laughs> and it was something people did out of necessity, right? But now, more and more, the dialogue there is changing, and people are aspiring to become entrepreneurs because they can be their own bosses, they can really dictate what they feel needs to happen. And um, the mechanisms, you know, funding and uh, the mentorship is also slowly catching up to that. Um, and the microfinance movement helped that tremendously, right, in the last 10 years you really saw awareness being sh you know, shown on um, the people that were lifting themselves up out of poverty thanks to their own business. But now we really have to take it to the next level. I see what's happened in the last 10 years as only the start, but to really promote entrepreneurship in India, we have to keep the funding channels open. We need to really increase the amount of funding, the amount of mentorship, and we need to, even more importantly, especially in India, create peer support groups for entrepreneurs to be able to talk to each other because they're still saying it feels very lonely. And um, you know, we just want to bounce our ideas off each other. We, we want to make sure we're on the right track. And so I think we, we have a ways to go. You know, as I said before, we've, we've, this is all about turning ideas into action and, and the learnings that we can get for practical uh, people trying to make things better. So, uh, uh, Nalini, you've been involved with three different uh, CGI commitments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, tell us about some of the learnings that you've uh, experienced in, in your work. Right. So, um, one of the things I've um, reflected on is that um, even small nonprofits like us can, don't have to wait for permission and can make big things happen. Um, so, we have uh, implemented a mobile um, technology program and diabetes where we use text messages to uh, teach 150,000 Indians. We reached a million Indians and we improved the lives of 150,000 Indians with just text messages about diabetes and its prevention in 12 languages. Uh, we're now building a um, mobile app for chronic disease prevention called My Arogya and we're testing it in healthy workplaces. The healthy workplace program has been fascinating. It's also a CGI commitment where we're getting 100 companies to become healthy workplaces according to criteria that we developed for India. So persuading companies one at a time to make that 
commitment to wellness um, has been has been a fascinating journey. Um, I also wanted to reflect on what the CGI community could do really about this such a big problem, chronic diseases. It is really uh, scary and um, it's it's a monumental problem, but the CGI community can rally around it. For instance, um, the private sector could make their own employees healthy. Um, um, we are doing that in India. Bhupa has a uh, chief medical officer um, uh, commitment around that. Um, the uh, I just uh, this week attended a um, session by Novartis where they are giving away a packet of 15 uh, NCD medicines in Kenya uh, at a dollar a, a dollar a month for each treatment, very affordable, very sustainable, and hats off uh, for you know private sector um, efforts like that. I never, I was a, I'm a prevention person. I never thought treatment of non-communicable diseases was an avenue worth pursuing, but it's really exciting to see that. As the father of a 15-year-old and an 11-year-old, I'm delighted and surprised to hear that texting can actually be a source for good uh, <laughs> rather than a giant time sink that uh, uh, distracts your children from everything else in the world. Uh, so, you know, one thing I'm struck by with all three of you uh, is that the potential synergies uh, in, in all the work that you do. And I think, I'm, interestingly, that comes involved in getting women into the economy and society more generally. Uh, because we, we know that not only are uh, women generally not playing the roles they could in society, in the economy, in the developing world, it's true in the developed world as well, but even more so in the developing world, but that getting them to do so would have lots of positive multiplier effects. They spend, for example, more of the money that they earn on health, uh, which has positive multiplier effects. Uh, they reinvest more in their businesses and run them more responsibly. They, they screw up less than men do in various ways. So <laughs> it, 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 do you find that thinking about gender actually uh, is something that that in that you're involved with in your work in your various different capacities, or is it just neutral people regardless of gender? Uh, Fifty-four percent of all the customers of Equity Bank are women, and it was a deliberate uh, effort, simply because we saw if we were to transform uh, uh, the society, money had to had to be in the hands of women, because once it's put in the hands of women, it is directed to where it was intended. The 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 propensity to divert money is uh, low. And also, I credit uh, <laughs> I also credit the performance of equity to the majority of the leaders in Equity Bank being women. And we have done um, a 10,000 women study, which was also a CGI commitment, where we asked um, 1,000 women in 10 different countries, uh, many of them developing countries, what is the impact of NCDs on your everyday life? And it was fascinating to us, just one uh, piece of data. 50% of the women said they had to provide care for somebody in their home with a non-communicable disease. And um, the 20 percent of the women said they had to quit their job to do so. Okay, so that's for us um, uh, shocking. And so women are impacted not only as patients and mothers, but also as caregivers. And so this elevates the entire conversation to a different level. And I'll say very quickly that the last three entrepreneurs that we onboarded to support with our funding and our mentorship were all women. These women have not only started their businesses, but they're now economically viable, they're growing, they've created 300 jobs just in the last three months uh, for primarily women. And just as you said, we've seen, and we, because we collect social metrics, we've seen how those employed women are now passing those benefits on to their children, sending especially their girls to school. So we hope that we can see you know, some kind of break in that generational poverty that way. I, I would like to say very quickly, though, that as much as we focus on wanting to empower women entrepreneurs and create jobs for women, it is much harder. They don't come banging down the door like the male entrepreneurs do with their business plans in hand. We actually have to go out and you know, really search for them, hold seminars, really encourage them to follow their ideas. So, so it's a very different approach, much more hands-on. It does take more resources. And it might even be more expensive, but the payoffs are, are endless and really worth it. 
Uh, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. We find the same thing in terms of the gender skew of authors. Uh, uh, they, uh, they submit less, uh, they, uh, uh, they accept commissions less. Uh, their work is better uh, on average, but uh, uh, it's hard, it requires more nurturing to, uh, to generate it as well. Um, at this point, let's throw it open uh, to uh, our audience uh, to bring them into the discussion. Uh, any uh, questions or comments for the various panelists? Yes, over here. Hold on and wait for the microphone it's coming to you. Uh, my name is Pop Guy. I'm with IntraHealth, an organization dedicated to the health workforce. I, I wanted to ask the panelists uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, opportunities for more intersectoral or approaches, because with the new MDG, of course, we're all called in to get out of our silos and see if we can reach out across sector for a more effective development. And um, I agree, during the first panel where we heard with um, uh, one of the panelists, we have a lot of principles, we have a lot of theory, but we really need to get into action. And getting into action uh, would mean creating new platforms so that we are more efficient. So as you are thinking at equity about financing capacity building, as you're looking at NCD, as you, you're looking at uh, providing loans and so forth, what opportunities do you see for helping the process of, 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 coming, of coming together, intersectorally speaking? It's a great question, and you can also expand it to be, you know, will the SDGs affect you guys at all, or is it just hot, hot air and talk? Right. So um, I'll take a crack at this. Um, in the case of the NCDs, the problem is so huge, and no one entity can solve it alone. So truly, multi-sectoral action is what is called for. The UN asked for it in the political declaration. Uh, everybody has agreed to it. It's not just words. It truly does require a new way of working together. So all our work, for instance, uh, we try to do in partnership with others. We don't do anything ourselves. Um, and I do believe the, um, whether it's the private sector or it's the government or it's civil society, everybody can work with each other. And I can, you know, we can provide examples, all of us. Uh, but it truly does require everybody to work together to make this happen. Uh, we know even prevention, for instance, is not truly just a health um, um, sector problem. It requires urban planning. It requires uh, Ministry of Finance collaboration. It's just a very different ball game with uh, NCDs. The SDGs, yes, um, uh, <laughs> it's theoretical right now. There's one uh, standalone health goal. There's a um, couple um, targets underneath that that, re that touch um, NCDs directly. It's all very heartening uh, because health wasn't even on the radar screen <laughs> in the first iteration. But exact action plans, I think it's still a way to go. Um, some of us are waiting uh, to see where it goes. Until then, we'll do what we are doing already. Um, and uh, more direct and concrete action plans were there for the w when the WHO a couple of years ago declared a 25 by 25 goal. So I feel that that, that is what's going to dictate action for a while. James, any? It's a great observation you have made because what we have realized, the 10 million customers that who need saving, they're the same who needs credit, they're the same needs who needs uh, uh, health and uh, require invest, uh, capital because we do provide credit. And uh, we have created a platform of collaboration and equity is able to achieve great scales because of uh, a partnership collaboration platform. For reasons like what I've had uh, tonight uh, here, uh, we have a telecom capability in the bank. So you could imagine the same telecom that is a channel to banking, uh, giving out these SMSs on how to, uh, to prevent uh, and treat diabetes and at the same time offering opportunities for those who want to invest. So you can solve these problems without having to build parallel uh, infrastructure and uh, creating parallel capability. It's just collaboration that you need. So silo mentality may be a big hindrance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, over here. Swanee Hunt. Yeah, thank you. I'm Swanee Hunt, as you said, excuse me. And uh, you may not know this. I am the founder and was the director for 10 years of the Women in Public Policy Program at the Kennedy School of Government. 
fascinated. It just dawns on me as we're talking about women, if you don't mind a little bit more, uh, the, you using words like you know finding them. You know they don't come to us in the same way. Nurturing them, encouraging them. It's really really interesting to think about quotas and the role of quotas in all this, internal quotas, external quotas. Would you all say some more? I, it just dawned on me that we may need to reframe this somehow instead of it being seen as these poor women, what's wrong, you know, they don't have the confidence or something. Well, there may be some of that, but it also may be that they're very smart and that they know that the amount of time it would take for them to write a piece for Foreign Affairs for Gideon Rose, <laughs> they need, it's a trade-off for them because of the care that they're giving at home and this and that and the other. Talk a little bit, would you please? You go first. Okay, <laughs> because I know you probably have a lot to say about this as well. Uh, thank you so much for that question and, and for how you framed it because I, I like to always give the caveat that even though I say those things, like we need a pull strategy for women and we need, to do something different. It's not because of the, the poor women or because they are inherently disadvantaged. And it's very much the opposite. It's in India, I see a number of factors at work that are, are kind of working against women from the get-go. For, for one thing, they are always multitasking. They are so extremely busy. And for them to keep their households working and for them to support their husbands' livelihoods and their husbands are often the primary earners um, and to just keep everyone else happy, that there's just a lot that needs to happen. And so a business idea is always kind of put to the side. Um, secondly, uh, familial approval is extremely important. And so I have met with some of our female entrepreneurs and my team in India when they work with them, they are often requested that to hold the meetings with their husband present or their in-laws present, just so they, they can also hear what the investor is telling this woman. And that really helps build up the confidence of the family members to then say, okay, I see that this investor is behind you and this is some real thing you're working on, so now go do it. Because without getting that kind of approval, it's very hard. I mean, she's a salmon swimming upstream trying to make this business work. And so th there's just a lot more at stake that I think we have to um, keep in mind and then plan for when we decide we want to empower more and more women entrepreneurs. Let's just take these into consideration. So um, from our perspective, we uh, look at women as a solution uh, to the NCD crisis that, that is ov often overlooked. So we think women are the ones who make the decision about the food the family eats and um, the physical activity levels they engage in and really um, should be the target of more <laughs> action and uh, attention. Uh, so we, for instance, are developing a new nutritional icon uh, called My Thali in India. So you know the big Indian plate with multiple containers. We're basing it on My Plate, the US My Plate. We want to develop a picture get, that can guide Indian women to lead their, whole, their own families to healthy living. So I think uh, more attention, more practical um, uh, empowerment tools will uh, be a real, real solution to this problem. And I will say that if every potential female author for foreign affairs was pitched me as frequently and aggressively as Swanee Hunt did, that there'd be a lot more female authors in foreign affairs. <laughs> so I'm a big fan of Sheryl Sandberg-esque leaning in. Uh, it does work. Uh, and uh, uh, let's take another question. Yes, over here. Um, my name is Grace from Kenya. And I think uh, I really appreciate what um, Equity has been doing. I have two questions, mainly on also um, women and engaging in entrepreneurship, because I think that is where my heart is. Um, you know, there is a line that sometimes is very thin be between um, having products for women and having the women who you really are targeting utilizing that, you know, that product. And I say this because most of the women who now are able to access most of the microfinancing are those who have already been in business for quite some time. However, what kind of strategies are you using to actually target and benefit that woman who, wants, who has an interest to get into business and yet has a lot of limitations? And again, the line of making sure that you do not have products that will eventually create some certain of level of fear. And I say this because of the consequences of being unable to pay back 
your loans and, and your credit. So how do you manage that kind of a line? Because the issue is you want the women to be able to continue to build themselves, not to leave them having gone backwards in terms of their ability to, to, to make themselves capable in terms of resourcing. Thanks. I, I think uh, there's a very good question. And um, if I jump to the previous conversation, I think one of the areas that uh, gives a lot of challenge serving women is cultural practices. Uh, and the way we divide responsibilities uh, within the family setup. And you find, uh, to a great extent, uh, uh, non-commercial responsibilities are assigned to women, like bringing up uh, the next generation and, and uh, providing food. And then men go and look. So that uh, creates that distortion. Uh, in opportunities. The second one is the issue of the way we have been socialized. If you look at the issues you are talking about, uh, women's uh, perception of risk is higher. So essentially we need in one way to help them demystify and say if you come to Equity Bank and borrow to buy a cow, uh, yes you have taken a risk, but you didn't have the cow. The worst that would happen is the cow being sold to pay the road. So you lose nothing. You didn't have the cow before. So essentially, that ability to see this differently and uniquely is something. But uh, you can't underestimate the power of capacity building in women, mm -hmm. particularly in uh, rural um, developing countries. Why? Because we are moving this population from peace and trade lifestyle uh, to a commercial world. And we shouldn't assume that the same skills and competencies uh, the, uh, uh, cut across the two worlds. So capacity building for me is what will transform uh, the role that women will play in the commercial world. 